proved in which, he said, every man has natural rights, black as well as white. This idea was discussed in every working class tavern. Many artisans believed it. The Boston Tea Party and the demonstrations in South Carolina from below and so on and so forth, all were filled with people who didn't like slavery. If you want a parallel, um, I was part of a big movement against the Iraq War. And one of the things about the Iraq War was it was popular with talking heads who were paid. I never ran across anybody who wanted to kill me for opposing the Iraq War. Um, or even was prepared to fight about it. Whereas with Vietnam at the beginning, because I was in the beginning of the anti-Vietnam War movement, I once spoke at a rally where there was a special forces guy who was baiting me, and fortunately there were 200 people there, so he didn't get to test out his skills on me after the rally. I was, really, I was grateful for this. <laughs> I'm not that tough. So, in 2004, at the Democratic Convention, which is always a very strange thing because it's controlled by money. So, Medea Benjamin of Code Pink unfurled the banner, U.S. Get Out of Iraq, while Theresa Heinz Kerry was speaking. And this was a kind of noble thing to do. So they hauled her out. Had her arrested, hauled her out. Terrible thing. The New York Times dutifully, I don't even think the New York Times reported it. You know, what, you know, all the news is fit to print. Was that fit to print? Is that news? But actually, I suspect that about 90% of the people at the convention agreed with her. And even John Kerry might have remembered that he himself was over the top about Vietnam. And it was the best moment of his life that he was over the top about Vietnam. And if he'd had a little more of that, he would have been elected president of the United States in spite of all the fraudulence about the election, because that election was phonier than the election of 2000. Um, but I won't go into that unless anybody wants to ask me. Just like I ain't going to go into Condi unless you want to ask me. <laughs> you know, um, poor torturer. So the American Revolution had a lot of people from below who fought slavery. And slaves led the way. And Governor Dunmore of Virginia Royal Governor Dunmore in 1772 said, you proud rebels, if you rebel, I'm going to free all the slaves and the indentured servants who come to my side, and I am going to sow destruction wherever I can reach, and I'm going to raise your mansions to the ground. And he repeated that for three years. So everybody got the idea. And blacks in the South flocked to the British side, so when he finally had his proclamation, in November 1775, 2,000 blacks showed up. Even though he was aboard ship, they figured out inventive ways of getting to him. And if there hadn't been a smallpox epidemic among them at the time, they would have propelled the British war effort even more than they did. And they did enough so the Americans had to recruit blacks too, which is how it turned out, and this is one of the most really striking things I found out for several years, German private named Floor was fought for the Americans, fought for the French, the Royal Dupont, was walking around the field of battle after Yorktown, looking at the corpses. And he said, most of the dead lying around the field are Mohren, Moors. Most of the dead in the crucial battle of the American Revolution, according to this German private who fought there, were Moors. They were 25% of the American troops, but they were the key ones that Washington relied on. He relied on them because they had fought for five years, unlike the mainly white soldiers in the militias who signed on for 10 months. So those who survived and kept at it tended to be, as Baron von Klossen said, the best under arms, the best maneuvers. There were a quarter of the total American troops at Yorktown, but they were the ones who took the crucial British strongholds and they paid heavily, and so did the blacks who fought on the British side. Now, if anybody taught you that, you're going to be the first person I met, and nobody told me that in school. That is to say that the teaching of American history in its founding myth is racist to the core. 
the American Revolution was part of an international revolution against slavery, which energized the cause of independence, which was for freedom. And in fact, it had the peculiarity that the British freed more slaves, and they took more slaves to freedom in Canada, and then they went to Sierra Leone and founded the first democratic experiment there, Freetown, which was a more striking democratic experiment than the New England town meetings and is a precursor of the Paris Commune and should be known widely except, you know, black folks did it. Because if black folks did it, then, you know, white folks don't know about it. So this book tells a story. Um, I have a student, Amantara Walrup, who's teaching it in Tyler, Texas, and he <laughs> assigned it in an American government course to 150 students and he had me come talk after a month and he, he wrote to me and he said, you know, I wasn't sure I would agree with this book, but I thought I would try it. And anyway, the students really got into it and read passages to him and some to me. There was one woman, an older woman, who said she'd seen a picture of George Washington praying by his horse. I know what he's praying about. He's praying about what to do about his slaves, she said. So it gives a different feel to thinking about American history. It isn't just biographies of great leaders. It isn't the American Revolution as a little thing up on a pedestal as if the American Revolution was isolated from all of these other revolutions or all these other uprisings. And if you look to the South, the black and brown people, in Saint-Domingue, the slaves rose up against the French colonialists and they made Haiti so independence and emancipation went together. And in Venezuela, when Bolivar was losing to Spain, the great liberator, he came to Republican Haiti and got aid in exchange for proclaiming gradual emancipation if he won in Venezuela. So if you look in comparative terms to the South, to the revolutions of black and brown people, you discover that the American Civil War is unique and eccentric. No other independence movement fails to at least gradually end slavery in the hemisphere. Only in North America did we fail to end slavery at great cost. And if you think about that for a while, imagine American history where we didn't have this kind of crisis over slavery. There would have been a lot of trouble over you know, relations of blacks and whites probably. There would have been a fair amount of racism. But it's hard to believe that you could have the kind of racism where a shape-shifting candidate who represents the point zero 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 one percent of the population actually has a reasonable chance of getting 50 percent of those who will vote. And if you were to ask what makes him so powerful as a candidate, a lot of it is. In the Republican Party, about 77 percent of the people express pretty overtly racist sentiments about Obama. I mean, Obama's a conservative. That's why Sullivan likes him. He's not a radical. He has a good heart, but as far as it goes, he's very cautious. He ain't going to change things all that much. It would be better if he had been bolder, but he hasn't been bolder. On the other hand, he's done some pretty good things. But these people, you know, he has Romney care. And now the question of whether they have any medical care and the decency of Romney care is being attacked by Romney using racism as an appeal. So if I were to say to you that a certain kind of darkness is about to pass over America, that is to say, not that we haven't been close before, I wasn't sure we were going to have another election after 2004. So I was amazed that Obama won. They got themselves, you know, two losing wars and the Depression. I guess they had some trouble. I mean, it certainly gave us some trouble. But this is a pretty decisive election. So let's take the Israel part. I don't know if everybody's familiar with the famous slogan of the Zionists in Israel, but it is, a people without land for a land without people. It sounds like the founding fathers were for freedom, except they wanted to have slaves. A land without people. So I talked to one woman, we heard her, who works very hard, she's part of an organization that works on displaced people. 
There are 400,000 people internally displaced in Israel. And we went around Dahisha refugee camp where they have been since 1948 living in little cubicles. And it's pretty tough there. And there may well be another intifada because things are so tough there. And there are 6.6 .6 million of the non-people of Palestine who are in Jordan and other places. So they are actually the largest displaced population of any people on the planet, according to the UN. Well, that's certainly a land without people. Now, I take very seriously what Europe did to the Jews. And I have spent a lot of my life fighting Nazis. And I have taught the course I originally taught Condi. She took eight courses with me as a master's student for some reason. And I'm toned down now compared to what I used to be. <laughs> so anyway, it was explanations of Nazism and fascism and the resistance to it in World War II. And I know a lot about Nazism and the Holocaust. And I used to, when I was not into nonviolence, that's something that I became about 25 years ago. But for a long time in my life, I was a violent revolutionary, and my friend Andy Goodman was murdered in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and I thought that if I could put the sheriff of Philadelphia, Mississippi, out of business, that would be a, a decent thing to do. And as far as Nazis went, I was perfectly happy to see them defeated. So it has been very hard for me to come to terms with that not only is Israel a settler state, which it is, but that the way it has treated and been allowed by the United Nations and all of the powers to treat the people who live there, the indigenous people of Palestine, is atrocious. And I'm going to describe to you a little of what I, happened there, and I would just say to you, I would rather that I didn't see any of the things that I'm going to describe to you. And if you can give me a reason to believe that any of these things are false, including that there wasn't just this opinion survey in Haaretz that says, Israeli Jews, they're for apartheid. You know, they don't have horror of South Africa. They didn't have a horror of allying with South Africa when they did a lot of military dirty business for the United States and Reagan with South Africa against Nelson Mandela, the government of Israel. But relatively few Jews, because, you know, in this country, Jews are very anti-racist, often, and inclined to be on the left. And like Obama, for example, and it's, so, it's sort of puzzling that a group of Jews, Israeli Jews, could say, really, apartheid is all right with us. And I put this up on my blog, by the way, and if any of you don't get my blog, I would be happy if you would give me your emails to send it to you. Because <laughs> I wrote about this, because I will just say that I will have to process this for many months. Um, but I think many of us found this unbearable. My friend Vincent Harding, who invited me, um, he was a close friend of King's, and he wrote the draft of King's speech on Vietnam breaking the silence. And he toured it out for many years. And I was going to talk to him about this book, and he said, how would you like to come to Palestine? Or Israel and Palestine? So it seemed like it was meant to be that I'd end up going to Palestine. So <clears throat> he's an important figure. So he was interviewed by Amira Haas for Haaretz. And I'll write, put up the article. And he spent, she spent a lot of the article talking about what he said, because what he said was, you know, he was growing up in Harlem. He didn't tell her this part, but um, his family had friends who were Jews, and he kind of identified with Jews when he was growing up. And a lot of his best teachers who saw the most potential in him were Jews. And